Hello, this is James Cox with the Martial Arts Lifestyle Podcast, and uh, today's episode, I'm very honored and privileged to have with me uh, Grandmaster Jay Berkey. Now, we know we do a little bit of everything with our podcast. That the point here is to provide some valuable content and information. Of course, martial arts related, but it's also for non-martial artists because it's uh, the lifestyle and and the way of the warrior, if you would, and the things that we do not only on the mat, but outside of our karate schools. Now, uh, Grandmaster Jay Berkey is here as a very special guest, uh, one of the many that we have in this weekend for an annual American Kajikembo Association training seminar. And wow, man, how fortunate and blessed that I am to have special guest instructors come in, not only that I can learn from, that our students and, and the community, you know, eventually can, can kind of all learn from and benefit in such a variety of ways. And um, this is a gentleman that, that I've known for uh, many years now and have really looked up to and have learned a lot from. Slowly, I, I feel that I'm a slow learner, Mr. Berkey, but I'm slowly uh, in you know implementing some of your philosophies and concepts and principles and I'll tell you they are quite quite unique but if you could sir maybe just introduce yourself tell us a little bit about your your journey uh, yeah I uh, I've always enjoyed physical things um, growing up I participated in sports and was quite competitive and uh, after college I didn't continue on because of marital problems so I decided to try and concentrate on my marriage rather than further education so I went to work at a sawmill and one of the guys that worked at the sawmill said uh, we're training over at this place in Kelso called Kaju Kembo and you ought to try it you'd really like it so I thought yeah it does sound like something I'd be interested in so I went over and I not only liked it I fell in love with it and all of those students that were in there all went by the wayside but I stayed yeah. and uh, my instructor did not make very many in almost 40 years of teaching. He made six black belts. Um, the requirements were rigorous, but I really enjoyed the journey, and I credit it with large part to saving my life. Mm -hmm. um, I drank a lot, kind of got in fights a lot, was a slow learner. Uh, and my instructor had infinite patience with me and guided me spectacularly, and it was the luck of the draw that I drew such a an exemplary man and martial artist. He, who knows? Everybody walks into a martial arts school and you think you're going to get, you know, it's the best, and you find out maybe years later that wasn't so good. Right. I got extremely lucky right off the bat. Um, he encouraged all of us. He never gave much praise, and his reasoning was that everybody's pretty quick to pat themselves on the back, but not very many are quick to kick themselves in the rear. So. He said, you'll, you'll do plenty enough patting on your back yourself. <laughs> what you need is somebody to kick you. Some discipline. Right? <laughs> Some discipline. So that started my journey, and classes were long and hard. Uh, but from, from the time I started, I don't think, well, at one point I had my leg run through an industrial tail pulley at work at the mill and had a double compound fracture. And... Um, I was in the hospital for two days, and those are the only two days I missed, and he came and visited me in the hospital. And I said, well, I won't be able to be attending class, uh, Sifu, because I got this cast. And he goes, nonsense. And he said, don't let a cast stop you. You've got your hand techniques, and you can use that as a pivot point. We'll beef it up if we have to, but I expect you to be here. So that was the men mental process that permeated the school at that time. And I attended all the basic, all the intermediate, all the advanced, all the Tai Chi classes. And in fact, the first five years, I think I missed five classes. Wow. And all my weekends were dedicated to going in and training on my own with some of my school brothers and trying to refine and perfect the stuff that he was uh, giving us. Well, one thing led to another, and I eventually got up and got my black belt. And uh, years went by, and I'm still with him, and I'm still with him. And in fact, I never did break with him. I, I stayed with him from the time I started till the day of his death, and I was by his bedside when he died. Uh, <clears throat> but he would uh, continue to try and push all of us, and I was a slow learner and quite stubborn, and sometimes his best way of dealing with me was I'd come in, and for a whole month he wouldn't say one word, wouldn't give me one correction or anything. And I'd be, you know, I'm thinking, even even me being slow after about two weeks, you go, what's going on here? This isn't right. Mm, right. And they say, well, you don't listen to what I'm telling you, so why am I going to waste my words? Okay, point mm -hmm. taken. Mm -hmm. So I was still a slow learner in that he would say, so I noticed 
he, Sijo, which was a creator, basic creator of Kajigembo, you had some others, but even mm -hmm. the others would say he was 85% of it. We right. contributed little bits and pieces to it. Uh, but he said when he, he wanted to go, approach Sijo to get a separate program, certified program in Kajikembo, a branch called Tompai. We, his lineage actually came from Ogung Ramos to Joseph Clark to my instructor, so it was Chuan Fa. But while he was in the Coast Guard, he had taken Muay Thai over in Thailand, and he had worked with a Tai Chi practitioner who at the time was 88 years old. Mm. And he said, I never saw a man with more power, grace, flow, or wow. speed than this 88-year-old 88 yeah, 88 man. Year old guy. Huh? So he said, I wanted to learn Tai Chi. So he took it while he was there, but eventually got out of the Coast Guard. And so then he looked up Tai Chi instructors in the area where he was, he was at, and he took some in Seattle, and then he took some from Portland, and eventually got certified in Tai Chi. But he didn't just do the usual form stuff. He took the principles that were involved in Tai Chi. So he said, well, Sijo told him, you have to come and spar with all my black belts. And depending upon how you do, and we will have a lengthy conversation over many days on the responsibilities and everything of having a separate branch and what, what it's going to entail. So he went over and he worked with everybody and did quite well, so he said, okay, you can do that. So he said, I'd like, because originally when I started training at the school, he called it Northern Kajikembo. To distinguish from just Kajikembo, mm -hmm. the Northern was for the Northwest, Portland, Oregon, you know, Seattle. The, right, the, right, the region. The region, mm -hmm. the Northwest branch. So he said, okay, then he had uh, Northern Kajikembo Tumpai, and then he had just Tumpai, which was still Kajikembo, but it was just called Tumpai. And the difference between the three was the amount of Tai Chi principles involved in all the tricks and the forms. He redid all the Kajikembo tricks and everything. I had to demonstrate them for Sijo against some very big, powerful people. And he said, if you do well, I will grant that to you. So he did. Well, so he, you know, it was a requirement to get a black belt. You had, you didn't have to be certified in Tai Chi, but you had to attend at least one Tai Chi class a week. Well, so in the beginning, I was only taking one Tai Chi class because that was required, and I didn't really like it. It seemed too slow, and I wanted to just, you know, More get hit, that, dig right, down and right. hit. When do we get the hit? <laughs> <laughs> so I was not a big fan of it. Uh, as time went on, I started developing, developing more of a like for it, and eventually even. On, after I, I became second degree, I was pumping weights. I was a pretty fair power lifter back in the day and bodybuilder. Uh, and I kept noticing that he just kept getting faster and better and more mm -hmm. powerful. And I kept asking him, you know, man, I'm pumping like crazy. I'm running 10 miles a day. I'm doing this. I'm doing hundreds of sit-up push-up lifting weights. Everything. But I said, you're five years older than I am, and I can't even touch you. Mm. You know, even with a long stick, I can't. And this was because of implementing the Tai Chi the tai principles. Chi. Mm -hmm. So he said, I'm not going to tell you. I've, we've had that conversation before. And so for, you know, years went by, and I think, God, I, I, I don't know what it was that he's talking about. And he never did tell me, and finally I figured <laughs> it out. See, I told you, I was a slow learner. <laughs> it was Tai Chi. And he said, yes. So then... Uh, I became one of only three Tai Chi practitioners that were certified by him. But the year that he died, uh, in March of 2008, we were on a beach in Maui, and he said, let's do some Tai Chi. So I did it, and he, he stood back, and he stopped, and he crossed his arms, and he's watching me. And, and uh, afterwards, he comes up, and this is very rare for my instructor. He shook my hand, and he says, uh, I'm taking you to breakfast. And I said, mm -hmm. what for? And he said, you got it. That's awesome. You finally got yeah, it. Yeah. He said, I certified three people, but you're the only one that actually got it. And I can see how far yeah. you've taken it. And he encouraged me to continue along that. He said, it's a personal journey. And if you find something, some mechanical failure or a structural defect, work with it and improve it. Well, I had a degree in mechanical engineering and I with a minor in, in physics. So math and physics are kind of up my alley. So I started analyzing everything, every technique, mm. how to make it the most efficient it could possibly be. Uh, and in Kelso, it was kind of a rough neighborhood, lots of bars, lots of fights. I'm, I'm 142 pounds and, you know, 5'8". I'm not a big guy. So I had to learn to get good to defend myself. 
So that's what prompted uh, my training, and I always took it further and further. Um, I I kind of condition my body differently than most people. Yes, you do. <laughs> I hit myself with baseball bats and, and uh, shins and the forearms and the ribs, and I punch myself in the groin and the throat and the face. Uh, I shock myself with the dog collar. Uh, anything to spawn perfection of the technique. Mm -hmm. uh, pain is a tremendous incentive. Yeah. Uh, when CJ was living with me, he told me the first thing after about a week, and he said, yeah, you got fair power, you got good power when, you, when I was working the bag. And he says, I'm gonna tell you something, Jay. He says, when you sit down to dinner, you always put an extra plate down. I said, what for? And he says, for pain, because you never know when he's gonna come calling, mm. and you wanna make friends with the guy. Uh. So I thought, wow, yeah, yeah. smart. Yeah, Don't fear yeah. it, it's there. Accept and that, it. Mm -hmm. and well, this led to that and other things led to when, and so again, it's the will, it's not, most people think the mind controls things and the mind doesn't. The body responds to the mind, but the mind will react to what the will tells it to. So the will is the ultimate ruler mm -hmm. of the body. Nice. So going back to the pain thing, then my instructor said, well, so that sounds great, but uh, how good are you at uh, or doing that? Or are those just pretty words? So one of the students at the time was a dentist and I became his client. And I he, you know, and said, well, don't, uh, don't use any anesthetic. Next time you gotta go and have a major tooth work done. So I was kind of sweating that a little oh, bit. Oh, right, but I, but I would I, be. <laughs> but I did it. And then later I had crowns, bridges, root canals, extractions, all done without anesthetic. Uh, in fact, the dentist became so impressed that he said, I would like to put you in the medical journals uh, and I have to have, I was going to have implants. That's $35,000 for the implants in the teeth. And I had to have special surgery, two bone grafts done, and one tooth I had to actually take a chisel and a hammer and hammer, split the bone to get the part of the tooth out. And I had no anesthetic. I think I'm kind of tough until I hang out and train and communicate with Grandmaster Berkey. Well, there, there <laughs> it's are a others. different level. This gentleman gave me a book by David Gogans called Can't Hurt Me, yeah. one of the most amazing people I've read these. about and inspires me. Yeah. As people like him that I get my inspiration from. Well, you so, inspire us, sir, that's for sure. So anyway, that proved to me that it is the will, not the mind, because my mind was going, are you crazy? What the hell are you doing? <laughs> I'm breaking out in a cold sweat, you know? Because <laughs> I know this is gonna hurt, yeah. but it's either hanging on and causing that constriction or letting it go and try. I tried displacement, you know, the, the way they talk about, I, I would go to a beach in Hawaii and I'm listening to uh, Hawaiian music and absorbing those beautiful Hawaiian sun out there with the tropical breezes mm -hmm. and I'm not there with him chiseling and hammering yeah. and he says when I look in your eyes you're not here and I go you're right yeah. I'm not so I'm there last place you would want to be that's the last place the, then that causes this constriction you hang on to the pain instead of letting it dissipate and go it's there what, what but about it's how breath you work do you put a lot of Breath work into, into no, that tolerance? Uh, or? No, I breathe normally. There are eight different types of breathing in Tai Chi, but actually one of the best that would work was spawned by the Navy SEALs, and it's a four-step breathing. Uh -huh. You yeah, heard of breathe that. in for four seconds, you hold for four seconds, you yeah. breathe out for four seconds, you hold for four seconds, and you repeat. So yeah. if you had to, and there's snipers especially use this drill for if you, uh, have to hurry a hustle and you get somewhere and you gotta make a shot and you're, you're breathing heavily, this will calm your breathing down very rapidly. So I did use breath somewhat, mm -hmm. but mostly it was just will. Well, yeah. so then will eventually became not only my best friend, but that's what motivated me to start pushing myself harder and harder. And that old there is no limit is really quite true. Wow. Uh, it, and it's brought, drawn me to the martial experience involved me and in so uh, you meet everything from former drug users current drug users doctors lawyers judges astronauts you name it they come you, to a martial arts right yeah and they train all, there all. and so you you're exposed to a variety of people that in my opinion nobody else gets which That's is true. sad because mm -hmm. it's such a vast world of both good and evil um, and it's a two-dog story the a little Native American boy asked grandfather, uh, when grandfather tells him there are two dogs that live inside every man, one's evil and one's good, and he goes, well, which one wins? And he says, the one you feed one you the feed. most. Right. Yeah. So I try to always concentrate on the good. I'm not always successful. I, 
I make mistakes, I'm human, but I always try to push myself and serve as an example, not just with the physical endurance or the, what you can do physically and tolerate, but on every level that I do. I don't do anything with 60, 80, 98, 99%. If I'm scrubbing a toilet, I'm gonna to guarantee you one thing, it's gonna be the most sparkling, clean, beautiful toilet you ever saw. Right. Whatever I'm doing, 100%. that's 100%. Yeah. My college instructor said, Jay, if it's worth doing, it's worth overdoing. Right. And he was right. Why settle? And that's just for me, and I try and instill that attitude in others. But if someone's happy with 60%, I'm not gonna tell them, you're wrong, no. That's their point. Who knows? Maybe later they might go and realize, eh, I'm going to go for 70 or 80 or 82 or 85 or 90 or 100. Who knows? So I don't tell them they're wrong. That's their life. But for mm -hmm. me, there was never even, and even 100 isn't good enough. And so I don't say, like, well, you can't go more than 100% capacity. But in a way, you can because 100 becomes static. And if you're improving, then what did you do? Pass that threshold. Pass that right? threshold. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so the further you push yourself, the greater your threshold becomes and the more capable you are to take on more and to endure more and to punish yourself more if and when it's necessary. Mm -hmm. A lot of the things that I did in toughening my body were to get me to a degree of refinement of technique, to precision, precision, precision. Don't allow one little thing to be out and go, well, it was pretty good and it got the job done. Uh, to me, if someone wins a fight but they're very sloppy in it, I'd say you had probably a couple things going for you. You had luck and your opponent's skill level was, was lesser. Was lesser, mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean you're great. Right. You're right. great when you, if you can look at yourself and you go, this is out, this is out, I did this wrong. And then you go back and you work on it. Now you get in and you, you take somebody else out and you do really well and you go, now that's a more justified thing rather than I beat this, I beat this guy up. But mm -hmm. your technique was bad, your discipline was bad, and I try to use that discipline in all facets. Again, I don't always succeed. Right. So from the beginning, it was a lot of uh, patience and um, tenacity and just your persistency, you know, to stay in there and, and to go through that training without, without the, 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 the corrections and you know, the praise, you know, you were very patient and, and, and steadfast on that. And then dealing with the uncomfortable, like the saying of going through the uncomfortable enough till it becomes comfortable. Right. right? And then you expand on that. No, don't say, oh, I'm done there then. Yeah. There again, there's never a limit. Again, it was mostly just luck um, that I happened to walk into that school or those guys recommended yeah. and I got that instructor. Could I could same, just as same easily with me. have got yeah. some yahoo that, you know, didn't know anything uh, and my instructor charged twenty dollars a month. There were never contracts. You could attend one class. Um, every class that was up to you. And if mm -hmm. you wanted to, you know, you could come in when you became an advanced student. Gave you a key. You could come in and train on your time off with your school brothers or whatever. And we had a very tight knit group <clears throat> of individuals that came in and worked on the weekend. We were all quite serious about <clears throat> our training. Um, wasn't all just about fighting. He, you know, he. He would give tests all the time. In fact, I failed one, kind of bad. Uh, if you, if you, uh, if you were late, you had to do like 100 push-ups. And if you were late twice in a month, you got booted out of advanced class for a month. Well, I was running late. I, I, at at that point in time, I had quit my job. I worked 20 hours as a janitor. I lived in a 10 by 10 place that had no heat. Water and garbage was paid, but I didn't have money for PUD, and I had to sell my vehicle and my bicycle, so I ran to work, and I ran to the school in Kelso and back. So I'm running, and I know I, know I was already been late once by a minute, and he goes, you owe me 200 mm -hmm. because it was me. And he goes, mm -hmm. you know, so I did. So I'm running late, and there was a lady out parked out front that was trying to change a tire, and I said, I'll be out in a minute to help you with that if I can. And I ran in the school and I made it in time. And so he pulled me aside and he says, uh, so how'd your day go? And I go, oh, it was pretty good, but I was gonna be late. And he says, I know, now you're out of class for a month. Mm -hmm. And he said, you didn't help that lady. Oh. Mm -hmm. He said, I'm trying to bring up ethical, moral people as well as good fighters. Here's an elderly lady in a bad neighborhood changing a tire and you didn't stop and change it. And I said, yeah. well, I didn't want to be late. You're I got thrown about out. Those push ups. Right. Well, <laughs> no, out. being thrown out thrown for a out. month. Yeah. You could huh. still attend all the other classes, you just couldn't come to advanced class. You think he still would have thrown you out if you were late because you took time to change the tire? No. Yeah. 
I don't know, but my right, guess right. is no. He would no. say, so why yeah. are you late? You know, well, I was helping a lady out there change. Ah, okay, good. Yeah. Right. So he'd have all these little tests. Yeah. <clears throat> and when it came time for your physical test, all these other things were already included in as a part of your score. Yeah. So you could do excellent on the physical test and flunk. Yeah, my instructor did a lot of random things like that, too. So like there's it, always strategy behind something, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> a good instructor will, you know, and if you're... If you're timid and shy or cowardly, he'll try and make you a little bit braver. If you're overly mm -hmm. aggressive, he'll try and simmer that down. Uh, balance. You know, bal yeah. get, a, get a more of a balance going there. And then change, change the high level. And he taught me something very good when, because my left side was never real good. So, you know, I was always the right hand, the big right hand and stuff. Uh, so I'd lead with my left side. Well, after that leg got broken and then I had I've had multiple surgeries on both elbows, both shoulders, and both knees. And that's excluding the war injuries from being shot and blown up. Oh. <clears throat> so, and then I've had other injuries that I didn't have insurance for, that, so they just had to heal broken. And just, you yeah, get by with the best, best that you it. can, yeah. just deal with it. Wow. <clears throat> you know, so, uh, one thing, uh, some takeaways from our training, and um, the podcast is audio. We also put a, a YouTube video on this version, but quickly, and I'm sure I'll probably have it wrong, but the, the principles, and, and I, I think about them at time that, that you talk about, like torque, elasticity, compression, elongation. Um, I don't know, if, but for others, but for me, and especially with the training and the application of it, it that always comes back to me as, as good value. Is, is that a little bit of the, those principles, right? Yes. And, yeah. <coughs> uh, tai Chi has... <clears throat> there are all different types. Of course, and you say, well, there's Yang style, Chen style, Ung style, Wu style, Sun style, and they, they go on and on. But good Tai Chi, first and foremost, was a martial art. It was not for health benefits. They just noticed that the ones that practiced it were healthier. Were healthier. Yeah. So it devolved, but that was after the Boxer Rebellion in China in 1900, and most of them left, and then when Mao came in, more of them left and went to Australia and Canada and Germany and other places. But the principles of uh, torque, helical torque, compression, elasticity, elongation, uh, target removal, uh, fluidity of motion, economy of motion, simplicity of motion, uh, these are all the principles that guide the movement of Tai Chi. So having said that, what to say for an example is, and Fluidity of motion would say, if you're going to do a double jab, say, for example, to somebody's chin, if you pulled your hand and you immediately extended through on the way with the jab with your elbow out at exactly three degrees, you will clip the chin with your with elbow. elbow. So now I could do that that quick, and you can't possibly yeah. double jab that quick. So it's not fluidity of motion, and it's not economy of motion. One has to lead into the other mm -hmm. to the other. If you go up to come down, you wasted motion. If it's down, go down. Change your play field. Ch change the area that you're going to defend against. So, and you, uh, to, uh, to get explosive, say for elasticity and elongation, I use the piece of surgical tubing as an example. If you just hold that piece of a surgical tubing, it's one foot long and you don't stretch it and you move your hands both to the left or the right and you let go of one end, what happens to it? just falls right. down. Mm -hmm. Now you stretch it and you let go of either end. What happens to it? It's going to snap. What if you stretch it all the way and you snap? Now it's going to come back very fast. Your body operates off the same principle. When you're completely relaxed, you're starting from zero. Mm -hmm. Once something's elongated and elasticized, all you have to do is let go of one end right. of it. Spring the up. same with yeah. torque. You separate the hips and the waist plane. So you create torque. Now you're going to get extra speed. Helical torque is not only are you doing that with your butt, you're going forward almost like a, on a helix, a spiraling degree forward. So you're going to get far more power, and it's going to be far greater speed out and speed back. When you push something out, when you're using your muscles and you push something out, how does it come back? You have to pull it back. With what? The same muscles that pushed it out. Right, right. But when you snap it, when you let go, when you stretch the bungee and you keep it that, when you snap it, what brings it back? The snap out brought it back. So it will be snapped out and snapped back. So your speed is going to be dramatically increased by having the bungee. And again, yeah. removal of target area instead of trying to do a hard style block. Not that there's one thing wrong with that. Mm -hmm. But if a guy 
got blocked that one time. So it was, did a, yeah. a broken rhythm, bam, and you blocked like this, and then you got punched in the face. Yeah. But if you remove your head, he has to reorient himself to get to you. Mm -hmm. So you're, or you hollow out so the blow comes right by instead of trying to. Just kind of mastering all the, the little details, man. I, so many people don't focus. It, it's just, uh, you know, almost like a monkey see, monkey mm -hmm. too. Dude, this is how you punch and this is how you kick. But don't, they lack the understanding. And um, you have a lot of really good principles of concentrating on the little details that make the big difference, the understanding, and the thought that, you know, this is, is real life training. And if it was, you may only have one opportunity. So you can't fail, right? Right. Yeah. Well, Mr. Berkey, man, it's a, a great interview. I really appreciate it. Um, to close, would you have anything that you'd like to add or say? Or? No, this is an honor to know Grandmaster Cox here, and uh, I think his group is phenomenal. Uh, produced many fine black belts, and uh, uh, I think the American Kajikembo Association is a good organization. I don't have anything bad to say about anybody in it. Uh, some of the other organizations with not only Kaji Kembo but martial arts, I could say. And, right. But, uh, you know, I just try and get with the people that are good and then make me good and hopefully I can serve as an inspiration to others to wherever you're at, push. And no matter what, it doesn't have to be martial arts. If you're going to school and you want to become a better student, there are instructors that would be more than willing to give time to help you do that. Uh, their time, their energy, and their sacrifice because they're concerned about you as a person and they want to see you grow. Mm -hmm. And the one thing they're looking for is a person who wants to grow. Mm -hmm. That's a teacher's dream. Yeah. Right. Whether right. it's a martial arts or in. It's a numbers game, right? <laughs> Going through enough to get to those. Yeah. yeah, we have a small organization, the AK, but it's of quality. And uh, you've added a whole lot of value, and I appreciate every bit of your sharing this, this knowledge, you know, that. that um, you know, is, is important and valuable and the details there. And I, I appreciate and thank you for your service and just your continued education you're passing down. So it was an honor. Thank you, and, sir. Uh, thank you guys. Appreciate it. Check out the video as well on our YouTube channel, James Cox Martial Arts. Thank you. Um, sometimes I have a... Yeah, Gerald Chavez. That's Gerald Chavez. All right. Okay. Can I call you back? I'm in a podcast right now, sir. Okay.